All right, I'm going to jump in and get started with some library announcements and introduce our speaker today. So first off, welcome, and we are here to celebrate African Americans of San Francisco and the work of Jan Baptiste Atkins. Um, we want to welcome you here to our more than a month events. We're rounding it out, um, but we promise to offer events all year round about Black history, Black joy, and about our Black population and culture in San Francisco and the Bay Area. San Francisco would like to, San Francisco Public Library would like to welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards in the lands in which we live and work here in the Bay Area. We are up, uh, encourage, we encourage you to learn more about first person culture and land rights and are committed to events and providing educational resources on these topics. SFPL would also like to let you know that the library is not a neutral institution and that we stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and support structural, systemic, and institutional racism in our own house and in our community and in our state and in our world, you know, as far as we can, as far as the library reaches. Um, we are working in our own house, like I said, we've just developed our own racial commitment uh, racial equity commitment, and that will be, you can find that in that link that I placed in the chat box. <clears throat> We've also placed uh, lots of reading lists about uh, more than a month, so about Black History Month, about um, Black art and Black joy, but also about being an anti-racist and um, incarceration of our Black population. Uh, lots of information in those reading lists, but also lots of um, celebration as well. So please check out those. And then I'm just gonna give some quick announcements because I wanna get on to our presentation. You can pick up all your books and all of that at our library to go locations. We're turning more and more locations in. So we'll, we're, we're coming, we promise. But please remember to mask up this beautiful art by Samuel Rodriguez. You can find him on Instagram. SFPL is celebrating our 16th One City, One Book, and we have selected author Chanel Miller for her book, Know My Name, a very powerful memoir of her sexual assault on the Stanford campus, campus and the subsequent, um, her subsequent experience with the judicial system. Uh, super amazing and approachable writing. She's an artist, and you can see her work at the Asian Art Museum right now. On Hyde Street, you can see this ginormous triptych mural she has up through the windows. Uh, along with One City, One Book, we are able to, with the support from our friends of the San Francisco Public Library, do a lot of programming surrounding the topics of this book. So we partner with a lot of people, and we bring a lot of people in, and I'm so excited about all the events that we get to do around the book, including this event with the McAvoy Foundation arts featuring Isaac Julian whose um, exhibition at the McAvoy has just been extended to April and you can make an appointment to see this it's free it's a multi-screen it's beautiful and lush and um, it's this particular talk will be with Judith Butler and Celeste, Celeste Marie Bernier um, and they'll be talking about the women in Frederick Douglass's life so the event uh, Isaac Julian's exhibition is about Frederick Douglass's life. Very amazing. Bringing the Gorilla Girls, and these are all part of One City, One Book. So definitely check out Google One City, One Book, San Francisco Public Library, and you'll find out way more of the events. And we're highlighting bookstores each month, and this month we're highlighting Borderland Books and Marcus Books, the nation's oldest Black-owned bookstore. And we encourage you to pick up Jan's books from there, or you can also order them from um, Arcadia Publishing or pick them up from your library. Shop local though. Like I said, this was this part of our more than a month and we still have this week of events happening. So please join us and Friday, I mean, sorry, the 25th, we have Jason Reynolds who will be speaking about the transformative power of writing and reading. And today without further ado, I'm going to welcome Jan Baptiste Atkins, and she's going to discuss her work researching documenting, uh, documenting African Americans in the Bay Area with a focus on African Americans of San Francisco. 
Her books are part of the Arcadia Publishing Company's Images of America series. African Americans of San Francisco tells the important stories of Black pioneers from the 1800s to today who helped establish viable African American communities. Jan captures these incredible stories and images of public figures, religious leaders, athletes, politicians, and everyday families as they mirrored the nation's slow progress toward integration. Jan is an educator and lecturer and author of Arcadia Publishing titles documenting African Americans in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Monterey County, and San Jose and Santa Clara County. She has spent the last several years researching the African American experience in the Bay Area. Her books document the success of African Americans and encourage school children and adults to read about their local history. It celebrates the rich African American experience as seen in photographs from area archives, museums, local newspapers, historical societies, libraries, and family or histories. And this event will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. And we will have time for Q&A. Please use that Q&A box. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jan Baptiste Atkins. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you, Jan. Unmute yourself, Jan. Thank you so much. I'm honored to have an opportunity to talk with you, to discuss with you my, my research. Um, that started about, uh, I would say about 10 years ago when I began, when I have a, an interest in learning about the lives of African-Americans from the Bay Area and particularly the pilgrim, the uh, pioneers. So I was really interested in the, in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And so I'm gonna begin with a discussion of my work. Here we go. Okay, so, Okay, so here's a map of early San Francisco. In the 1840s, uh, black pioneers lived uh, around the um, Embarcadero and near the water. So 14 blocks bounded by Broadway on the north, Pine on the south, Powell on the west, and DuPont on the east. Some families also lived between Bush and Vallejo adjacent to Embarcadero. Um, this information was readily available as I began my research at the public library. And I came across authors that had, had started identifying who African-Americans were that came during those early years and where they lived. Uh, the theme of traveling to California, the continent's end, in search of new opportunities is prevalent throughout San Francisco's history, as well as the history of other California cities. Early settlers of the 1840s, both black and white, heard the call to go west in search of gold, to develop a business, to acquire land for a new home, to establish a place to raise their families and to grow crops. African-Americans came from every state and the West Indies, both slaves and free men. Some worked in, in the gold fields, while, while others worked as domestics in homes of, of, of um, other Californians. In some also established businesses and some worked in farm work as farm workers. The aim of my book is to inspire conversations about the efforts of the early pioneer leaders who envisioned new lives in the West. Hopefully this book will inspire new ideas within the leadership of our communities to continue to build on economic, social and cultural contributions and focus on the overall history, cohesion and livability of San Francisco. So I, my book is divided into four chapters. The first chapter is uh, chapter one, 1840s to the 1900s. So this is San Francisco's early black pioneers. Chapter two, 1900s to the 1950s. And that addresses war, migration, employment opportunities and the emerging black community. Chapter three, 18, I'm sorry, 1950 to 1980. This is reshaping African-American communities, leadership, civil rights, student rights and redevelopment. And then chapter four, the present after the turmoil. So I'm gonna present a little bit of data because I'm sure many of you are wondering, well, how many black people even live in San Francisco today compared to the past? 
Well, let's look at the past. In 1860, the black population reached 1,176. By 1900, the black population grew to 1,654. By 1940s, the black population reached 4,846. By the end of World War II, the black population grew to 21,000. By, but by 1950, the black population doubled, 43,460. By 1970, the black population reached 96,000, which was 13.4% of San Francisco's population. Today, the black, the black population has um, dropped from the 96,000 in the 70s to 48,000 out of 874. Uh, 1,961 total population. So the black population in San Francisco as of 2018 uh, represented about 5%. So then I began to ask myself questions such as when did people of African heritage begin migrating to, to California, specifically San Francisco? Who were these early pioneers? Where did they come from and how did they live? Well, the first person I'm going to introduce, I'm sure you've all heard of William Alexander Leesdorf. He was a merchant captain from St. Croix, the Danish West Indies, uh, from the Danish West Indies to San, he migrated to San Francisco in 1841. So he's considered, uh, from my research, one of the first, one of the first uh, to settle uh, persons of African heritage to settle in uh, San Francisco. He was a wealthy businessman. He established businesses, built the city hotel, was elected to, to the town council in 1847 with others and with others, he started the public schools. He was the first to bring a steam vessel into San Francisco water. So he was, a, he was in the shipping industry and he began, he developed his business in New Orleans. And so he brought his business from New Orleans then, he brought the first steam vessel into San Francisco and then he decided to stay in San Francisco. So he didn't become rich in San Francisco, he brought his money and he was able to continue to flourish and develop and, and to, and to uh, continue building his wealth in San Francisco. He died in 1848. He's buried in Mission Dolores. But no one knew of his heritage until after his death. So um, his friends, he had several good friends in San Francisco, decided to go to St. Croix to find his mother, to let his mother know that, know that he died. And um, when he met his mother, his mother was a black woman. And of course, they're very surprised. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so William Liebsdorf. <laughs> Alvin Cope, the little story is a little different, but still very interesting. Alvin Cope was brought to California. And those who were brought, he didn't travel on his own steamship, but he was brought to California in 1849 as a slave to work in the mines. And uh, in, 1840, and, in 1854, uh, he decided that he wanted his freedom. So he began working for other, other uh, uh, gold miners, uh, white gold miners, and raised extra money. And he was able to buy his freedom from his owner. And then uh, once he was able to buy his freedom, he also brought the, uh, bought the freedom of his family members. And he moved his family members from the South uh, to um, San Francisco. They settled throughout the Bay Area, but several of them settled in, in San Francisco and became prominent citizens. One of his granddaughters became the, the very first uh, um, preschool teacher in San Francisco in the early 1900s. And we had the case, so there's another person. How did Archie Lee get to San Francisco? He was a slave. In the case of Archie Lee, he was a fugitive slave who was tried in the courthouse in San Francisco. Local black residents raised money for Archie Lee's defense. He was freed by the Supreme Court. So how did this happen? Well, California is known as a slave state. I and mean, that's what we were taught in our history books. So we, we probably thought that this meant that slaves were not allowed to, that owners could not bring slaves into California and slaves could not be maintained and, and could not work in California. Well, that's not the case. Owners were allowed to bring their slaves to California but what happened is that California uh, would not allow the selling and buying of slaves. And also California would not allow the slave owners to bring their slaves and move to California on a permanent basis, which meant they were able to temporarily 
live in California with their slaves. And temporarily meant a few years. And after a few years, they had to go out of state. Well, that's what happened with Archie Lee. So his owner put him on a ship and he was out there in the waters off of San Francisco and he was going to go back. He was on a boat and he was gonna go back to, uh, to the state where he came from. And, um, and then he, but he ran away. He jumped off the boat and the, the townspeople, they, they uh, hit him in an apartment in a place in a black residential housing situation. And then, um, then he was arrested and while he was, when he was arrested and in jail, then he had his court case, which, which the first case, uh, the owner won that case and was attempting to send Arch, put Archie back on the boat to send him back, to go back to leave the state, which was required in California. And then what happened is he, he ran away again. And after he ran away, uh, then there was, uh, during the meantime, his, his, his case was appealed. And the Supreme Court heard his case, and Archie Lee then was uh, was was released, and he was he was emancipated by the courts. Uh, Archie Lee decided not to uh, continue living in San Francisco, and in the late uh, 1850s, he uh, departed and went to Victoria, B.C., and relocated in Victoria, B.C., along with 400 other other black uh, uh, residents of San Francisco. I'll talk about that a little later, about why so many black residents wanted to leave San Francisco back in the late 1850s. But we have another person, Mary, Mary Ellen Pleasant. I'm sure many of you have heard about Mary Ellen Pleasant. There's a wonderful plaque um, of her on Bush and Octavia Street. But anyway, Mary Ellen Pleasant was born in slavery in Virginia or Georgia. Uh, it's not quite clear which state, but this is where she, she was born. And she and, and uh, she's born in slavery, but then she was freed. As a free person, she moved to San Francisco in 1852. Mary Pleasant became a successful businesswoman and civil rights leader and philanthropist. She joined the black abolitionist efforts of the Bay Area and was known to contribute to the defense of slaves seeking freedom. So she was one that, that helped to support Archie Lee and his quest. It is believed she helped finance the John Brown raid also. She also started a boarding house for homeless girls in San Francisco. Mary Ellen uh, died penniless in, 19, in 1904. Well, there is a Mary Ellen Pleasant uh, Memorial Park, so to speak, uh, sort of a memorial space. And as a mother of civil rights in California, she supported the Western terminus of the Underground Railroad, which was uh, the Western terminus ended in Oakland. And this was for, for fugitive slaves, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and, and this was um, between 1850 and 1865. This legendary pioneer once lived on the site where the plaque is located. Her house was just adjacent to the plaque. And, and she planted uh, six trees. And those six trees that you see are, but may not be the original six trees, but these were the, the, those six trees planted in this particular uh, adjacent to the plaque represent this, her, the trees that she planted. The plaque is placed at Bush and Octavia Street, and it was placed by the San Francisco um, African American Historical and Cultural Society in 1975. Well, we're going to find out a little more about Mary Ellen Pleasant because she's very important too. So Mary Ellen Pleasant um, successfully sued the railroad in Pleasant versus North Beach and Mission Railroad. And the reason she sued was because she wanted to desegregate San Francisco's public transportation system. So it began with a woman by the name of Charlotte Brown. And Charlotte Brown was able to ride the train to work or wherever she was going every day, whenever she wanted to. And, but because it was never crowded. And at one particular time, the, the train was crowded and, um, and she was told she had to get off the train. Well, she had already paid her, her fare. So she got off the train. She was told to, to get off. She had no choice. She got off the train and then she sued the train company, the omnibus cable company for $500. She won her case, but she won her case because she had already paid. And, and the ruling was that um, the, the company did not have the right to take her money and then not give her uh, the opportunity to ride the train. So that wasn't good enough because, because it did not help other black citizens of San Francisco. 
So Mary Pleasant sued the railroad, the, the railroad, um, uh, North Beach and, and Mission Rail Railway, and in an effort to desegregate the uh, public transportation system so that all black people had the right to ride the trains. So in 1863, black residents uh, were able to ride um, the trains. Then we have George Dennis. But George Dennis came to San Francisco in 1849 with his father and his brothers who were white. Since he was black, he was a slave to his father and his brothers. He eventually bought his freedom for $1,000 with the money that he earned from his job at the El Dorado Hotel at Washington and Kearney. So he was um, it's like a bus boy. His job was to clean up after the, the, the patrons of, the, of this um, El Dorado Hotel. And, uh, and, and I was reading his story and it, 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 the story was about how money would drop on the floor and he was, it was okay for him to keep the money as he cleaned up the floor. And he saved the money and, and he was able then to, to, to buy his freedom from his father and his brothers. Well, he was sort of a business, he had a business mind. And so he, after that, he went ahead and he, and he decided to establish his own business. The business that he established was what is called a horse livery business, which was a horse, uh, a business where he's uh, grooming and taking care of horses. And this was located right in the city and he became very wealthy. He married Margaret Brown, sister to Charlotte Brown. So Charlotte Brown was the woman who sued the, 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 the omnibus company. And he married her sister and he worked, he, was, he joined the abolitionist movement in San Francisco and he worked very hard to free other slaves. He also was another person who helped to finance the defense team for the slaves uh, who were brought to San Francisco. Then we have James, uh, John Jameson Moore. He was very important too because he was also, uh, he came out of slavery uh, from West Virginia, but he traveled to San Francisco as a free man. He established the first African Methodist church, which was one of the very first black churches established in San Francisco. And it is still there today. Um, this was in 1852 and the church was established on Stockton street. He also helped to establish the very first uh, school for black children and the school at that time was located in the basement of San Cyprian's church on Jackson and uh, Virginia Street. Moore was also the publisher of a short-lived publication. Uh, it was like a newsletter called The Lunar Visitor. Uh, he traveled throughout the Bay Area after establishing the church and establishing the school. He traveled throughout the Bay Area ministering to the black communities uh, from as far south as San Jose and as far east as uh, Sacramento. So he has a very interesting story too. So here's a here's a rendering of the very first of the first church, which was 18, which was in 1852, and it was established in, in San Francisco. And so you can see uh, it was organized in 1852, and in, the picture is that on Stockton Street, the church on Stockton Street. Well, at that church, First Amy Zion, he hired a pastor by the name of Reverend Alexander Walters, and he was a civil rights leader. He worked, he worked as, pa he pastored the church from 1883 to 1888. In 1890, he became a member of W.E.B. Du Bois's Niagara Movement. And this Niagara Movement uh, addressed lynching, discrimination, and other issues facing black Americans during that time. Shortly after, after that time, after 1890, he left San Francisco to join the mother church. But while in San Francisco, he continued to address some of the discrimination issues that uh, San Franciscans were facing. We have Eliza and William Davis. So they started the, the second uh, black church and this was called Third Baptist Church of San Francisco. In this case, uh, um, African-Americans uh, could not, uh, Attend, well, African Americans could attend First Baptist Church, but during that time they were only allowed to sit in the balcony. And that was pretty common for churches, for white churches. So black uh, parishioners were able to attend, but they just couldn't sit with everybody else. So Eliza and William Davis decided in 1852 that they wanted to, they wanted to worship in a church that, that did not discriminate against them, but saw them as equal. And they started their very own church and it was, uh, they opened their home for the first time. So there's a plaque in my book 
And this plaque is located today. Uh, the plaque is there in San Francisco commemorating this very first church. And um, I'll let you know. Oh, it's on a DuPont Street. So anyway, if you have my book, you can read a little more about the first church and the plaque that was given to the church. Then we have an educator by the name of Jeremiah Burke Sanderson. He came to California in 1854 as an anti-slavery activist and speaker at the first meeting of the Convention of Colored Citizens of San Francisco. So this was this was another church. Uh, well, this was AME Church, but this, this church that he became a part of was called Little Pilgrim Church in San Francisco. Today it's known as Beth, Bethany AME Church and it is still in operation today. He moved to San Francisco in 1859. He became the principal of the very first black school that was founded by, by uh, John Jamerson. And he, um, in the basement of San Cyprian's church, well, what happened is that the, John Jamerson and others decided to hire um, Jeremy Burke, Jeremiah Burke Sanderson, because he was an educator. And then he, was, he served as a principal and the first teacher for the school. After eight years, Sanderson left San Francisco and he went to Sacramento to establish schools. So we had black schools were established during the same time period in San Francisco, in San Jose, and also in Sacramento. And Jeremiah Burke Sanderson was a part, had a part of establishing all three of those schools. Then in 1849, once again, you know, who were some of the, the, the um, pioneers that came to San Francisco? Well, we had Mifflin uh, W. Gibbs, uh, Gibbs. He came to San Francisco in, 18, in 1849. In 1855, he started the very first black newspaper. This newspaper was called the Mirror of the Times. He also led 200 citizens who left San Francisco. Well, there were 400 citizens, but 200 families who left San Francisco due to prejudice treatment, and they decided to relocate in Victoria, BC. So part of the problem that, uh, the reason why many black families decided to leave San Francisco is because there was a law that said that, that black of that non-white, so they meant black, Asians, Indians, non-whites could not testify against a white person. And San Francisco was a little bit prejudiced at the time too. And so because blacks could not testify against a white person, um, they began looking for another place to establish their homes. And so there was an interesting, um, I read an interesting advertisement in the newspaper, the Mirror of the Times. And the advertisement was from Queen Victoria, and the advertisement was uh, telling telling black people that come to come to Victoria, we'll find jobs and we'll find homes. And so, what happened is, 200 citizens decided to take her up on it, and they left San Francisco and on on a boat at the same time, and they relocated uh, to to Victoria. Later, Gibbs became so Gibbs was the one that led. He actually led those citizens out of San Francisco. And later he became a judge in Arkansas. He came back from, he went to Canada. He established a business there and his family, but then he came, he moved back to Arkansas and then he was appointed as a US consul to Madagascar. Well, we have Philip Bell. Now he was a co-editor of San Francisco's second black newspaper known as the Pacific Appeal. So he actually ran this newspaper from 1862 to 1864. Then he established another newspaper called the Elevator Newspaper. And this was from uh, 1864 to 1879. Bell learned the newspaper business uh, while working for, under uh, William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass in New York. And he uh, worked with them in, in abolitionist politics and the newspaper business. So he, so he was able to bring his expertise to San Francisco. The Elevator newspaper became the longest running black newspaper in the Bay Area. Bell died in San Francisco in 1879. He also traveled throughout the Bay Area to San Jose, to um, other parts uh, uh, of, of the Bay Area, uh, uh, discussing his newspaper, reading the newspaper stories, gathering newspaper uh, information and newspaper stories to include in the next editions. So he was pretty intense and pretty successful as a newspaper man in the Bay Area. We have uh, another shipper, Captain William Shorey. 
1878, he came to San Francisco on the, way, on, a, on the whaler, Emma F. Herman. Captain Shirley was nicknamed the Black Ahab. In 1887, he married Julia, and she was a daughter of a very prominent Black family in San Francisco. So Black whalers were uh, Black men who served on whal whaler ships, and they were the crew members of the ships. Captain Shorey was the only black captain on the West Coast. So here's a photograph of a whaler ship. And uh, so, the, so this was the kind of business that uh, Captain Shorey uh, did. In eight, as I mentioned earlier, in 1850, over 200 families boarded ships and departed San Francisco for Victoria, BC because they were fed up with the lack of progress towards equality and race and, and also the racist laws of not being able to testify. Here's an example of a family. This is Hannah, uh, uh, Hannah Estes and her children. And in 1850, Anna and two of her children uh, traveled and they went to Salt Springs Island, which is in Victoria, BC. They built their homes there and they established a small community. Here's another a family that left San Francisco and uh, to go to Victoria, BC. Schools were, established in, schools were established in Victoria, BC so that children could get education, which at, at that time, the black school hadn't been, as, uh, was still in, in development here in, in San Francisco. So many parents wanted the kids to go to other schools, wanted to go to public schools, and there were no public schools in San Francisco. Today, in Salt Spring Island, the community of descendants from the original black San Francisco families who boarded ships still exist. So I had a wonderful experience and then I wrote to uh, the Salt Spring. Well, first of all, I wrote to Victoria, BC, the museum, and they led me to Salt Springs Island and said that's where the families actually uh, lived, established a community. I contacted the museum there at Salt Spring Islands and they were the ones that sent me the photographs and to let me, and, and then also assured me that, that there's, there is still a black community in Salt Spring Islands. Uh, today and this community are, are some of them are descendants from those from San Francisco who left back in the eight, late 1850s. So my next question was what type of work was available to African Americans in San Francisco? So now we know that um, there were black businesses in San Francisco. Nearly 200 black employees worked at the San Francisco's famous Palace Hotel from 1875 to 1889 according to Douglas Henry Daniels who was a, a famous researcher and writer. Many worked in, in raising livestock. Many worked in agricultural businesses. Many started their own businesses. Some worked as teachers. Many worked as butlers, domestic workers, barbers, seamstresses, janitors, and other jobs like that. Here's a photograph of um, the Palace Hotel. And this photograph was uh, taken in 1878. And so at that time, there were many people, uh, many black people who worked, who worked uh, in the domestic departments, I'm sorry, who worked at the Palace Hotel uh, doing domestic work and also waiters and things like that. So it reads, Negro chambermaids and porters on the upper balcony of the Grand Court. So the 20th century, in terms of 20th century of African-American leadership, we see that there were leaders in the areas of civil rights, student rights, redevelopment. According to the US Census, the African-American population in San Francisco increased uh, from 4,846 in 1940 to 43,460 in 1950 due to defense industry employment opportunities uh, at the shipyards and other jobs. African-American population in 1970 increased to 96,078. Um, they worked in semi-skilled and skilled jobs. The great migration of African-Americans who left the rural South and sought job opportunities in the urban North resulted in over 6 million African-Americans relocating to Northern cities. And many came to San Francisco, came to California. Many African-Americans marched for equality. African-Americans lived in the Fillmore District. Many lived in the Fillmore District because this is where African-Americans were able to rent and buy homes. African-Americans owned businesses 
uh, in the 10 block area of the Fillmore um, was filled. This area was filled with restaurants, pool halls, theaters, and stores. In the 1940s to the 1950s, African-Americans were limited to patronizing black clubs and hotels and rooming houses. So, so San Francisco was, was segregated. For musicians, the Fillmore though became a place to entertain fans and San Francisco's residents. Often both black and white fans would flock to the Fillmore to hear John Coltrane, Frank Jackson Trio, or Eddie Alley, and many other jazz musicians. Here's a photograph of Jimbo's uh, Bop City, an after hours club where music, where music brought black and whites together to enjoy their favorite Fillmore musicians. And the, the Bob, uh, Jimbo's Bop City was located near um, the Marcus Bookstore. Actually, it's just uh, upstairs from the Marcus Bookstore. And this photograph actually came from Marcus Bookstore. The family of the Marcus Bookstore had this photograph in their, in their family uh, collection. Willie Mays faced discrimination in San Francisco when attempting to buy a home. We know that uh, Willie McCovey played. So one of our, just wanted to recognize one of our great uh, baseball players. In the 1960s, Negro American Labor Council, the Negro American Labor Council led the campaign for hiring African-Americans as checkers in grocery stores. So there were lots of protests and lots of, of, um, of um, just, and efforts to overcome some of the discrimination that African-Americans faced in the 1960s. We have Bill Chester, a, a union leader in 1964 who met with San Francisco civil rights leaders to promote anti-discrimination strategies. We know that Martin Luther King visited San Francisco. Here we have the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who was very active in San Francisco in the 1960s. They fought to end employment discrimination in the retail industry. Willie Brown often met with students at San Francisco College. San Francisco State is known as San Francisco State University. Now at that time it was San Francisco State College. And he represented jail students who were involved in student unrest. In 1968, we have Dr. Nathan Hare who was recruited as the first chairperson of the Black Studies Department at San Francisco State College. Hare was active in the BSU and student strikes. Dr. Hare continues to live in San Francisco today. Well, urban renewal in San Francisco primarily affected the Black communities of the Fillmore and, the Bay, and, Bay, and Bayview Hunters Point. Houses were moved out of the Fillmore in the 1970s. Houses were destroyed partially due to the dilapidation of, of the turn of the century old Victorian houses. So urban renewal had a major impact on the Fillmore district. Mary Rogers started the Western Edition Community Organization, which forced the city to help relocate displaced residents. So relocation was a real problem um, for families who were displaced. We have community activists, Hannibal Williams, Pastor Eugene um, Boyle, and Reverend Cecil Williams of Glide Memorial Church, who are community activists during, the, during that urban renewal time period. And also fought to make sure that the rights of the displaced homeowners were protected. In the 1970s, families dislocated by redevelopment were able to move into newly constructed family housing. So, that was one of the positive outcomes. In Hunters Point, many African-Americans lost, lost employment opportunities after the war and, the defense, and, and after defense industries closed. Navy housing was offered to the housing authority for public housing, but in 1966, riots broke out because of lack of opportunities for uh, young black men. By 1966, many young black men were disillusioned and could not find employment. Many low-income families were displaced and had to relocate to the East Bay or the South Bay because of high unemployment and an increase in welfare recipients from neighborhoods 
uh, from neighborhoods that became crime ridden and also as a result of, of urban renewal displacement. With the help of the Bayview Hunters Point Housing Committee, the rights of the citizens were finally protected. I wanna thank you very much for this opportunity to share my uh, research and my book. Uh, I've highlighted may, uh, a few sections of the book, but I also wanna let you know that uh, this book is available there at the library, Arcadia Publishing Company, Barnes and Noble. I also found out that CBC stores throughout uh, San Francisco and other counties also, and Walgreens in San Francisco, they're also carry, uh, may sell this book. Or you can contact me at www.africanamericanhistories.com. And I would be more than happy to make sure that you receive a copy of this book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. I'm gonna give you a couple questions that we have and folks, you can put your questions in the Q and A and let's get started. So someone from YouTube is asking about um, Mr. Liedersdorf and how he was able to kind of get through the white supremacy of the time. <laughs> well, here's the answer. He was of Danish and African heritage and he was able to pass. But while he was, uh, so no one knew that he was black until after he died. But what he did do was that he made sure that San Francisco, he helped to establish those early, the early uh, businesses of early San Francisco in the 1840s. And so San Francisco, California wasn't even a state. <laughs> San Francisco <laughs> wasn't even the location, but, but he was one of the, Early, he was one of the of the early businessmen to help build uh, that early that early city, and so it wasn't uh, until so he he did actually is not known for um, his contribution to help build the black community. No, not at all. But he but but he was a philanthropist uh, as a person in his own right. So and we have to recognize him, and and he was a black man. Thank you, Jan. And then another question is, why is it that the folks moved to Victoria, BC? What was it about that location? Oh, because, uh, well, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, Queen Victoria, uh, she advertised in the black newspaper, come to Victoria, BC. And part of the reason was because they were looking for workers, but they also offered housing, a lack of discrimination, schools for the children, communities to live in. And, um, and when they went to Victoria, BC, it is, it is uh, research shows that they worked, they were able to get jobs and they, were, and they were treated fairly in San Francisco. People of color, I wanna make sure it was, I'm not just saying black people, but Chinese, I mean, sorry, Asians, black and Indians could not testify against a white person. And there are lots of stories in the black newspaper of, of uh, whites who would, um, you know, um, do commit a crime against a black person and the black person could not could not do anything about it. If they were robbed or if they were burglarized or something like that, a black person could not testify, could not complain. And so this is what drove families out of San Francisco, black families. Eventually that law was overturned though in the, in the 1860s, early 1860s. And so that was one of the very first, so it was called the black codes and one black code was that blacks could not testify. So that's what drove the families away. And, and it was very, very, very prejudiced place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And then another question is, um, have you done any research about uh, San Francisco African-Americans that trace their family history to any of the pioneers you highlighted or others who moved here in far past? Uh, you know, yes, I did. In researching this book, I was able to research the families who actually were descendants of some of the early families. But it's really unfortunate in that there, until recently, there wasn't a place where Black families were able to, where families were able to house some of their family documents. 
And so it was passed down from generation to generation to generation. And much of those original papers have been lost or misplaced. Now though, well, as I, when I began researching for this book, the library, your public library uh, was a great resource for lots of information about some early families. The Kofay family is still in the Bay Area. Uh, and at the time when I did my research, I was not able to locate uh, members of the Kofay family, but since then I have. So I'm really happy to say that the Kofay family still exists in descendants of descendants of Alvin Kofay, which was what we know of one of the first black slaves brought to San Francisco who, who bought the freedom of his family and then moved his family to San Francisco. So they're, they're in the Bay, they're, I don't know that they're in San Francisco, but I do know that they are in uh, Vallejo and other parts of the Bay Area. Yes, Jan, your, your research expands all over the Bay Area, which is really amazing. So definitely encourage you to check out those books at the library. And our History Center is definitely deep. We are the archive for San Francisco. So we have so much stuff, including like um, the redistricting and the uh, demolition in the Fillmore. We have all of that information, which is just so amazing and so tragic. Um, so there is a question, which I think is sort of interesting. Do you know anything about the rise of Jim Jones in the 70s and how that impacted <laughs> our black, the black community? You know, <laughs> yes, in my research, I, I found out a lot about Jim Jones, but unfortunately, once again, I, I, I have to, in order to have the, for this particular book, I, I had to have the actual documents and from archivists, from libraries, from the, the historical societies, and that information was not available at the time. I, I think that there is a, I, I believe I, I heard that, that there's an effort to collect some of that information. And so I think that's underway now, but at the time, yes, I, I, I knew a lot, I, I'd heard a lot about it and I had come across it in readings, but I did not come across documentation, families who actually wrote about their, the experience of their loved ones that actually went to with Jim Jones off on, on the trip to Grenada or wherever it was, yeah. Jamestown, yeah. Oh, there's a, a person in the email or in the chat who's a Jonestown survivor who would love for you to contact them. So oh, great. Yes. Well, I that, can try and connect that off offline. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I like very much to talk to uh, the J J uh, survivor. Um, and then there's a question again about um, documents and documentation and um, how does that get saved? You know, like where where are the, your resources from throughout the Bay Area? And, you know, I guess I'm questioning are like personal people still holding these documents and well, How are we going to get them public? Well, well, you, well, the library, first of all, uh, there was a, from what I understand, when I started my research, the library, uh, apparently at some time period, which probably was, I would think the 90s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, uh, solicited families to share their family documents. And the library at one time was housing that, that, that information was, and so that was a place where families could store some of those family photographs and some of those original documents and things like that. Because when I was able to, to go through some of those files and look at some of the photographs and read some of the family stories. And some, in some cases, families have, have preserved oral histories. And so they've, and they've take recorded those oral histories. And so for me, I use the libraries, the archivists are so helpful. The California Historical Society, the African American Historical Society, the state, state of California libraries, the African American Museum and Library in Oakland. Every city has an, histor an historical society of the San Francisco pioneers. Uh, there are so many organizations who, 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 who decided that it's their job to, to maintain, to collect and to maintain this local history information and it's there. And, and the first place to start is with the librarians because the librarians have a, a resource, a, a reservoir of information about where to go to find this information. <laughs> Maybe I set you up for that question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you for that library love. And we definitely have so much information and um, I put a lot of links into the chat box and we even have the newspaper that you mentioned. Um, oh. 
what was it called again? I'm blanking. Well, you you do. You you have the Pacific Appeal because when I researched for my master's degree, I I just about made my uh, I had my own desk <laughs> up in the library, and I was able to read the newspapers uh, on microfilm. So excellent. Yes, yes, the elevator yeah. newspaper. That's the, the one. Elevator that Pacific yeah. Appeal. Yeah, you have both of those there. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. All right, friends, if there's any more questions, let's get those in the box. I see lots of chat, lots of love. Thanks so much for this history of Blacks in San Francisco. And I'm going to come back on screen. So Jen's mm -hmm. not alone. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I put the link to today's document in the chat box and I'm going to do it again and a number one question that always comes up is can we see this event again and the answer is yes this event will be on the SFPL's YouTube channel you can pick up Jan's book at our library or like I said your local bookstore please do that and you know any library you're at in the Bay Area will also submit that request to purchase these books for the library. And we always, patron request is number one in our world. So Jan, I don't see any more questions. I thank you so much for your knowledge and your history and sharing it today. And like I said, I'll be calling you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed sharing my research with so many of you. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see your faces, but I, I know you're there. I, I see your, the, the questions in the chat and I just want to say thank you so much for for spending an hour with me to talk about my research and uh, and I look and I and if you have questions don't forget to contact the library um, all of this information is available at the library the redevelopment files I was able to find at the library and um, and of course and then there's also the Bancroft library which is another great resource but all of the photographs, I want to say that in my book, I have about 185 photographs in each of the books. There's three books I've written. And, um, and all of the photographs come from uh, an archivist. Uh, I, they're, they're original, they're, they are original photographs. So I just thank, thank you so much, Anissa, that the library is, has devoted, has become a resource for families to go to, to uh, share their, their family stories and family history. Yes, absolutely. I'm putting your website in the chat box one more time. But friends, I will send you out a follow-up email that consists of all of this stuff we talked about and lots of great stuff I put in the notes while Jan was talking. And everyone thanks you and thanks you for your knowledge and sharing Thank it. You. And we do. We see you out there. We virtually see you. We miss you. We love you. Thank you, Jan. And have Thank a wonderful you. rest of your Saturday. Thank Goodbye, you everybody. Thank you.